If I asked you what the winningest sports team of all time was, what would you say? You know, I imagine some of us could uh, predict that that would be the UCLA Bruins basketball team under coach John Wooden. Or there are probably some of us in our community that would say, that's easy. It's any team that Tom Brady plays for. And I know, in addition, that there are some of us across our locations who would probably say, based on their number of Stanley Cups, that it's the Montreal Canadiens. And I can appreciate that, even though I'm not a Habs fan. I, uh, as a Leafs fan, wouldn't know winning if it ran over me. But we have uh, mutual respect here, and we honor each other's convictions in what we call love beyond belief. So you Habs fans, you, you go for it, and, and, and you just be you. But uh, the truth is, none of those answers are right. Because the winningest sports team in all of history, with a winning record, get this, of 87% for over 100 years, is actually the All Blacks rugby team of the country of New Zealand. That's right, the New Zealand All Blacks are the winningest sports team or franchise in history. And it kind of makes you ask the question, like, what is so special about them? What do they do or get to deliver those results? I heard a story once that when you become an all black, when you join that team, you're given a, a book, kind of a, a black leather bound book. And when you open that book on the very first page is the very first or an early jersey of the all blacks. Like there's a photo of one from 1905. And then when you flip the page, you see the next iteration of the All Blacks jersey in 1924. And page after page after page just shows you the iterations of the All Blacks jersey where all of a sudden in the middle of the book, there are some comments about the team itself, about their policies and you know their ethos and culture and their standards. And then on the second last page, there's a photo of the most recent All Blacks jersey, the one that the player would be able to to put on themselves. And on the very last page, it's blank. And this booklet, as I understand it, it's given to would-be uh, rugby players on the New Zealand All Blacks team, uh, not so much as information, but more as inspiration to let them know, especially with that blank page at the end, that when you put on that jersey, you're expected to leave that jersey better than when you found it. You're expected to leave that jersey better than when you found it. And I think that that's what makes the New Zealand All Blacks so spectacular and such a successful team, at least one of the things, is because when you come and play rugby for the New Zealand All Blacks, you don't just join a rugby team. You enter into something where the expectation is that you would contribute to having a legacy. I want us to appreciate that this fall, as we've launched into this teaching series to kind of kick off our year with a bit of vision and direction, um, we feel like it's, it's not any old September kickoff series. That coming out of COVID, uh, there's a very real sense that we're kind of relaunching or replanting a church. And so what we wanted to do was focus on the most basic aspects of what a life of following Jesus, according to Jesus, is all about. And I think as we wrap this up today, um, we're going to focus on what arguably is the most significant value of all. And that is the potential that a Jesus follower has to live a life of legacy. That when you put on the jersey of a Jesus follower, you don't just live a life here on this earth. You have the potential to live a legacy that outlives you. Take a look at what the Apostle Paul teaches in a letter that he wrote to the Colossian church in chapter 3 of the book of Colossians. He says there, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you 
also will appear with him in glory. In this short section of text, the Apostle Paul does two things. He provides some instructions to these first century believers, and then he uh, provides the basis on which he provides those instructions. So when we look at the instructions, first of all, they're pretty simple. He says on two separate occasions to set their mind or heart on things above. And the repetition is meant to provide the emphasis that that's what he's ultimately wanting them to do. And when he talks about heart and mind, he basically means the, the whole person, their whole perspective. And in addition to the repetition, he also provides a contrast to get specific with what he's talking about because he tells them to set their hearts and minds on things above where Christ is and not of earthly things. To focus on where Christ is, not on earthly things. Basically, the Apostle Paul wants his readers or hearers to embrace a life with an eternal perspective. Then he provides them the basis on which they should live that eternal perspective, appreciating that when they have made the choice to follow Jesus, in the same way that Jesus died, they've died to their life on earth and now have their identity hidden in Christ. And as their identity exists and is united with Christ, where he's seated at the right hand of God, Paul says one day he's going to return. And when he does, he says, when Christ appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That when Jesus returns, followers of his will get to enjoy community and worship with him forever. He says the reason you should live on earth with an eternal perspective is because your destiny is one of an eternity with Jesus. As far as this life on earth is concerned, you've died to it and your identity is with Christ in eternity for eternity when Jesus finally returns. Now, when you come back to the New Zealand All Blacks, you can think that, you know, it's quite compelling of them to inspire people to not just play rugby, but to be part of living a legacy, to leave the jersey better than when you found it. But I'd want us to appreciate from a spiritual perspective that we're invited into something even more compelling. Because what Jesus invites us into is not just leaving this world better than we found it, but making a difference and living a life today that's not just going to outlive us here on earth, but living a life today that will have impact and legacy for all eternity. You know, as I think about this kickoff series and the basics of the invitation of Jesus that we focused on, part of the reason that I feel like this is probably the most important of them all is because this eternal perspective that Jesus intends would drive our life on earth, this eternal perspective actually drives all of the other values we looked at. You know, you think about the first week, we talked about the point of a life with Jesus, which is ultimately to live beyond yourself, to aspire to pursue the way of Jesus in following him, and to increasingly learn how to be for the people he was most for. Like Jesus, learning to relinquish your privilege to invest your life in those of less privilege. Well, why are you going to do that without living with an eternal perspective? Why would you relinquish anything of a life of this earth if your life on this earth is all that matters? Think about the second week when we talked about living with a power beyond yourself, relying on the divine enablement of God to live the very life that Jesus invites us into. How are we going to rely on that divine enablement without a perspective on the divine relying on him to do that? Or think about week three when we talked about a people beyond ourselves and God's vision for community where all of us, even if we feel like outies, can live like the ultimate innie because in Christ we are. Well, all you have to do is start by looking at the Trinity himself, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and realize in that same image-bearing way, we're meant to live in community and oneness here on earth. But you don't start there unless you start by setting your mind and heart on those things above. And then last week, when we looked at a purpose beyond ourselves and uh, discovered the, the, the power in these unlikely friendships of mutuality and reciprocity, whereas we say around here, friendship makes the difference. 
all you have to do is to want more than anything else for God's will to be done and his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. But you're not going to understand that unless you have your perspective fixated on heaven, desperate to experience more of it here on earth. That's the key for this entire series, for all of the different ways that Jesus invites us to live beyond ourselves. It requires that eternal perspective in order to live the point that is beyond ourselves, a power beyond ourselves, with a people beyond ourselves, and for a purpose beyond ourselves. We've got to live with a potential beyond ourselves and live with an eternal perspective to actually experience the kind of eternal legacy that Jesus intends. And I know when I say that, I'm sure there's some of us that are, you know, carrying burdens today that just make it impossible to look past the here and now. And you're probably sitting there wondering, like, you know, what about the challenges that I'm facing right now? What about the stresses and struggles in my life that are causing anxiety today? What about those relationships that I'm desperate to make whole? What about those abuses that I'm trying to escape from? What about those financial pressures and challenges? I mean, you can't go to your visa bill and click eternity on the date when you're going to make your, your next payment. I want us to appreciate that Jesus not only loves us, Jesus wants to meet our needs, but he wants to meet our needs from the posture of people who enter into a life of following him, not to meet our needs from a posture of people who treat him like a vending machine. And the only way we relate to him is so that he meets our needs. There's a difference and we've got to be clear on the life that Jesus invites us into. And so if you're struggling to adopt and embrace that eternal perspective, you know, ask yourself what it is that you're asking Jesus for. Are you asking Jesus to provide heavenly blessing to your earthly focus? Or are you looking to Jesus to provide an earthly experience of blessing not just like uh, uh, health and wealth or whatever, but his, his comfort, his guidance, his peace, and his presence. Are you asking him to provide an experience of earthly blessing on your heavenly focus? Is it heavenly blessing on your earthly focus or earthly blessing on your heavenly focus? Which is it? Because Jesus invites us into one of those and not the other. And this, at the end of the day, is the counterculture, counterintuitive way of Jesus. As he summarized in Luke chapter 9, he said there, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. You and I can experience a life on earth as it is in heaven provided that we keep our attention and our energy and our perspective fixed on heaven and the eternal. If you're wondering how to do that day to day, um, kind of making things practical, I'll provide three steps that any one of us can take today in order to live that kind of life that outlives you because we're living with an eternal perspective. The first involves including future believers, basically allowing people who haven't yet embraced a life of faith to join you in yours. You know, I know all of us have friends or family members, coworkers or classmates, teammates or neighbors, that if they discovered what we were trying to be about as a, as a church community, looking at what we call that Gandhi gap, where he says, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians, your Christians are so unlike your Christ, and trying to live in a way that closes that gap. I know that in my life, my, my friends and family, they're compelled by that. And rather than try to convince them or argue with them or persuade them to follow Jesus, what's way more helpful is just to include them in joining in with you, checking out a, a, a weekend service with you, coming and joining in a conversation with your life group or serving with you in your location's anchor cause. Allow them to be included with you and allow God to do the convincing where you and I can experience nothing more gratifying than seeing someone we care about in the waters of baptism professing their faith in Jesus Christ. Another step we can take involves inspiring future generations, investing our lives into people who will most likely literally outlive us as a younger and emerging generation. 
We can do that formally around here through our family ministry, signing up for and participating in that, especially this fall as we're uh, recruiting and building teams in our nursery and uh, preschool program, our kids ministry, m and or our student ministries, Riot for junior high or Current for senior high, or in informal ways, just being kind of a, like a big sibling to a younger person, investing in their development as a mentor. You know, I once heard a pastor say that the greatest impact we have in this life may not be in something that we do. It might be in someone we raise. And so give some thought to how you could invest in future people, uh, not just, you know, include people in your life of faith. Third thing, a little tricky to talk about, but I'm going to throw it out there, calling it investing in future impact. Investing in future impact. And it's tricky for me to talk about because... Uh, the scriptures are clear that when it comes to things of this earth, especially like brick and mortar level things, um, those are things we can't take with us into the next life. Those are things that just fundamentally do not last. And yet, the scriptures are also clear that in certain occasions with certain special projects, Projects like low housing initiatives that we're imagining in Welland or projects like a brand new shelter that we're dreaming of in St. Catharines. These kinds of projects can serve as home bases to make an eternal investment and to make an eternal trajectory changing difference in the lives of people that will last forever. And so once in a while as a church community, we draw people into what we call our future development fund to over and above the contributions that we make Sunday after Sunday or week or month after month um, to also invest in the future projects that God might have for us. We're going to be talking about some of these in a couple months uh, during our Hope Lives series. But if you want to do that and just make uh, your check or make your donation earmarked to our future development fund, you can be making the kind of investments that seek to make the kind of eternal difference that changes the trajectory of people's lives forever. One such project that I've been involved in lately involves uh, a new leadership development ministry that we've recently launched here at Southridge called the Leaders Village. Uh, the Leaders Village is uh, just nothing more than trying to consolidate and to improve all of the leadership development that we do here at Southridge, as well as consolidate and improve the leadership development that we offer as Southridge to the surrounding church community. And then on top of that, partnering with churches and leaders and ministries to do those first two objectives better together than if we could alone. We've recently launched this ministry. Our website, leadersvillage.ca, is going to launch next week. Uh, in the meantime, if you're a social media person, you can follow us at Leaders Village on any social media channel and just discover what God's doing through this new ministry that he's launching. But one of the cool things that uh, I've started to experience already is the way that it's become a, a landing point for this book that I wrote during uh, the COVID season. This book that, as I said in our kickoff morning, we've been making available uh, across our locations, free to anyone who wants it or to anyone who wants to get one to share it. And if you haven't been in any of our services in person so far, but want to go and pick one up, you can still do that. This is the last weekend for it. But what's cool about it is it takes the legacy of the story of our church captured in Finding Our Way and creates legacy for the book in the Leaders Village that then in turn makes investments in churches and leaders all across the country and around the world that can have further legacy. It's our lives having cascading legacy. And you know what the coolest part is? As one friend who read through the book said to me, they said, you know what I love best is that the book isn't finished, that there are still chapters to be written and I get to be a part of it. Gang, that's where we find ourselves at the dawn of this ministry launch season that essentially is relaunching a church. We get to be part of the incredible story of God for all time that lasts forever where we get to contribute in our lives on earth to having an eternal legacy. When we put on the jersey of a life of follower of Jesus, we get to have an eternal legacy. If we'll not just live out the point of what Jesus invites us into, 
which to be clear, is not a life of treating him like a vending machine or just going to him for what we can consume from him. We've got to appreciate that the purpose of the church is not to just provide things for us to consume. The purpose of the church is to incarnate Jesus, who was the incarnation of God and the incarnation of love in our world today. And to do that personally and together involves relinquishing our privilege to live for those of less privilege, and to be for the Mateos more than the Glens, to be for the kinds of people, as we talked in our kickoff Sunday, the kinds of people that Jesus was most for. We can only live with that eternal perspective first if we're going to be clear on the invitation of Jesus. But once we get that down and once we understand that the point of all this is to live a life beyond ourselves, then we can go for it in a power beyond ourselves, with people beyond ourselves, for a purpose beyond ourselves, and a potential beyond ourselves. Because when we put on the jersey of a follower of Jesus, we're not just here to make the world a little better than when we left it. We're here to leave a legacy. And if we'll live with an eternal perspective, if we'll set our hearts and minds on things above where Christ is, not of this earth, we can experience right here, right now, that kind of eternal legacy together. Let's pray. Jesus, I'm just so thankful for the life that you've invited us into collectively as a community and for where you have us in this kickoff season as a church family. I pray that in all the ways that we're being invited to step into further devotion to you, and further community and mission with one another, that you would just touch our hearts and give us guidance and wisdom to know which steps you're calling each of us individually to take. But I pray that more than any one step, that we would just kind of cover all of those steps with a newfound perspective today, that we would embrace the kind of heavenly and eternal perspective that you desire followers of you to embrace so that we can make sense of all of this, why we would die to ourselves, why we would relinquish our lives on earth for something far grander. Jesus, inspire us with the kind of eternal legacy that we can have when we invest our time and talents and treasures in this life in ways that vastly outlive us and help us to celebrate the ways even in our lives on earth where you are faithfully not just building your church but ushering in the realities of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We love you and we thank you for all these things. We pray in your precious and powerful name. Amen.